In this video, let's do a quick review of extreme value theory and its application to financial risk management. Let's begin by taking a look at the importance and challenges posed by extreme values. So what exactly is an extreme value? Think of an extreme value to be one which has a rather low probability of occurrence but still has a high impact. If let's say I were to pick up a historical data set, let it be let's say a data set containing historically observed daily losses then you will agree with me that the observations of extreme values would be rather few. Okay. Now, if I were to try and fit a proposed distribution to this historical data set of losses, the level or let's say the degree of fit would be quite good when it comes to the body of the distribution, I mean the central part. The degree or the level of fit would be quite poor, I mean quite compromised when it comes to the tails, the left tail and the right tail. If I were to use this fitted distribution, which is actually quite poorly fit in the tails of the distribution, to estimate risk measures such as VAR and expected shortfall, then these risk measures, they also would be poorly estimated especially if I am working with high confidence levels. So where does EVT step in? EVT would give me the statistical tools that I need to smoothen and extrapolate the tails of my distribution so that the estimates of risk measures such as VAR and expected shortfall, they become much more accurate at high confidence levels. Okay? Now, Within EVT, we will take a look at two approaches, block maxima approach and peaks over threshold approach, also called POT approach. Now in block maxima approach, let me do this. Let me take my historical data set of daily observed losses and let me break it down into, let's say, a number of blocks of equal size. For illustration purpose, let's say my data set contained these 12 losses which I have subdivided into 4 blocks each containing 3 losses. Okay, next, let me do this. For each of these 4 blocks, let me locate the maximum loss. So I will have 4 maximum losses, one corresponding to each of the 4 blocks. Let me ask you this now. What is the distribution of these maximums? Well, I don't know the distribution of the losses which I began with. Let me assume that this distribution, I mean distribution of losses, also called the parent distribution, is not known to me. Maybe I know qualitatively speaking or descriptively speaking some aspects of this distribution. My distribution can be fat-tailed. My distribution can be negatively skewed and let's say all these aspects are known to me but I do not know precisely speaking which distribution my losses are coming from. Okay. Now to answer this question and that is what is the distribution of these maximums that's where the block maxima approach comes and helps us. This approach, it comes and tells me that as the size of each of these blocks, let's call it n, increases and hypothetically, let's say, approaches infinity, the maximum value coming from any of these blocks, let's call it m subscript n, would follow a distribution called the generalized extreme value distribution, GEV distribution. And therein lies the power of this result. I do not know the parent distribution, but I do observe that the maximums, they are converging to a distribution which comes from the generalized extreme value distribution. Okay. Now, two things to note about this GEV distribution. Number one, this distribution has three parameters. Mu, which is a location or, mu or mean parameter. Sigma, which is a dispersion or let's say scale parameter and Psi, which is a shape parameter, also called the tail index. The values of these, 
are estimated using a technique such as maximum likelihood estimation and it will be based on the sample of data that we will be working with. Okay. Then the second aspect to note about the GEV distribution is that it is called generalized for a reason. Within GEV we have three different distributions that are contained or subsumed. If my parent distribution is known to be a fat tailed distribution, for example, let us say the student's T distribution, for example, the Levy distribution, for example, let us say the Pareto distribution, then I will observe that Xi for this case comes out to be greater than 0, it comes out to be positive and the GEV distribution becomes the Frechet distribution. If my parent distribution is relatively light tailed, for example, the normal distribution or let us say the log normal distribution, I will observe that my tail index, my Xi comes very close to 0 and my GEV distribution becomes the Gumbel distribution. Lastly, if my parent distribution is very light tailed, light tailed compared to the normal distribution, I will observe that my tail index comes out to be negative and my GEV distribution becomes the Weibull distribution. Okay? Now, please note that when it comes to financial variables, only these two distributions are of interest to us. Out of these two distributions, which one do we end up working with depends on the value of the tail index. There are some guidelines that you can still keep in mind to choose which of the two you will be working with. If your parent distribution is a fat tailed distribution, you should ideally be working with the fresh air distribution. If your parent distribution is a light tailed distribution, you can work with the gumbel distribution. Also what you can do is that you can perform a hypothesis test on the estimated value of the tail index and then decide which one of these two should you work with. Lastly, if you want to be very conservative as far as the values of the var and the es that you will be estimating using, using this approach by all means work with the fresh air distribution it will give you much more conservative estimates of var and es okay now how do you put the block maxima approach to work to calculate the var for let's say this historical data set of losses if you are working with the data set directly, that means if you are working with the parent distribution directly, var would very simply have been equal to the quantile picked from the original data set corresponding to a probability level which is equal to the chosen level of confidence. Now that you have spent the effort to find the distribution of the block maximums, what you can do is that you can use the distribution of this guy to find your var and it will be very simple. All you have to do is pick a quantile from distribution of this maximum corresponding to a probability level which is equal to the chosen level of confidence raised to the power n where n is the size of your each individual block. Okay? And this estimate would come out to be much more accurate as compared to the estimate from the parent distribution directly. Okay? Next, let us come to the peaks over threshold approach. If this approach worked with the maximums observed over each of the blocks, this approach works with the excess loss over and above a chosen threshold. Let us work with the same data set. Let us pick a threshold, let us call it U. Let us focus on the portion of the loss which is over and above the U. Okay? Let me define a cumulative distribution, let us call it F sub U, which essentially gives me the probability of the excess loss X minus U being less than or equal to a certain level lowercase x, given that my loss is greater than u. Okay, so that means I am filtering only on those losses which are above the threshold and I am specifying a distribution of the excess of each of these losses over and above the chosen threshold. Again, as we had in this case, 
in a limiting sense as this u keeps increasing i'll observe that irrespective of the parent distribution this cumulative distribution approaches the same distribution and that is the generalized pareto distribution the gp distribution this distribution compared to the gev distribution has fewer parameters only two beta which is a scale parameter and psi which is again a shape parameter again these two parameters they get estimated using a technique such as maximum likelihood estimation okay now what you will observe is that if your parent distribution was a normal distribution the tail index the shape parameter comes out to be very close to zero if your parent distribution was a fat tailed distribution this guy the tail index comes out to be positive and this is the situation where the tails of my distribution they disappear rather slowly now how do i compare these two approaches and eventually which one should i work with the pot approach is quite popular because it makes much more efficient use of available data so for example this data point was not used in this approach because it was overshadowed by another data point in the same block this data point is still an extreme loss in the pot approach we do include this data point because it is above our threshold the second advantage of the pot approach is that it has one fewer parameter for us to estimate but the tricky aspect is how do you fix the u the threshold i would want the u to be high enough for this result to hold but if i pick u to be very high my filtered losses which are over and above the threshold would be quite few and that will make my estimates quite inaccurate okay so u involves a trade off so how do you use the pot approach to calculate the var this is the formula that this approach offers to calculate the expected shortfall this is my formula these formulas are actually not very difficult to remember for this formula i can read it as u the threshold plus a certain multiple of the scale which is beta what is this multiple the fraction of the losses which are above the threshold divided by the level of significance alpha the whole thing raised to the power of my tail index minus 1 divided by my tail index my shape parameter okay es i know is greater than the var so es is equal to var plus beta minus psi times u the whole thing divided by 1 minus psi okay so for a very fat tailed situation where psi is positive a number between 0 and 1 you will see that the es becomes much greater than the var okay this was about evt applied to a single random variable we call it univariate evt if you want to extend these results to multiple random variables you will have to dig into what is called multivariate evt when we work with multiple random variables the first and actually the most important consideration that comes up is how to model and capture the dependence between our random variables now you can assume your random variables to be independent that's one extreme as far as an assumption goes you can assume that your random variables are normally distributed and dependence can be captured using a linear measure such as correlations but both these assumptions i mean independence and dependence captured using correlations are very inaccurate when it comes to multivariate evt okay because the focus of multivariate evt is to accurately capture what is called the tail dependence between random variables tail dependence think of it to be the probability the chance of your random variables landing up in their respective tails at the same time okay and multivariate evt focuses on capturing this tail dependence what multivariate evt tells us is that the limiting distribution of multivariate extreme values is observed to be a member of extreme value 
copulas. Okay, so we have this family of extreme value copulas and the limiting distribution of our multivariate extreme values is actually one of, you know, one of the members of this family of extreme value copulas. The chosen member, please note, can have a dimension which is appropriate for the number of random variables that we are working with. Okay, so this video was about a quick run through of what is extreme value theory all about and how it is used in financial risk management.